Hello, NEPHEW community. My name is Leah Beard, Medical Science Liaison with Atsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization. And I'm Sahar Salehi, also Medical Science Liaison with Atsuka. We are here with Dr. Kamya Kalantayazadeh to discuss renal nutrition and the dietary management of chronic kidney diseases. Dr. Kalantaz serves as the Chief of the Division of Nephrology, Hypertension, and Kidney Transplant at UC Irvine and has a very extensive resume of experience in the field of nephrology, consisting of decades of research, hundreds of publications, involvement in journals and scientific societies and associations, and much more. He is acknowledged as one of the foremost experts on renal nutrition and dietary management, consistently presenting at national and international conferences and publishing in numerous top-tier journals. Dr. Calentin, thank you for joining us. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. So we are here today to talk about medical nutritional therapy in the CKD patient. And there's ample evidence that nutrition therapy induces favorable metabolic changes in CKD, prevents signs and symptoms of renal insufficiency, and possibly delay the need for dialysis. Despite this body of evidence, there remains hesitancy within the nephrology community about implementing medical nutritional therapy into daily practice for our CKD patients. So Dr. Kalantai, you have years of experience effectively applying nutrition as part of the treatment plan for your kidney patients, and we would love to hear some of your success stories. Would you be able to tell us about a non-dialysis general CKD patient for whom you have used medical nutrition therapy and, and provide us with some of the details? Yes, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be part of this program. So uh, it's quite interesting. This is usually the first and last question that the patient asks each time they come to see me. And in between, they repeat that, doctor, what should I eat? So Dr. Calantar, <clears throat> I'm here since uh, I, I look you up and, and you are a nutrition expert. When I go to this nephrologist or that nephrologist or, or uh, internist or family practitioner, I always ask them, what should I eat? What should I not eat? And, and it's quite interesting that this is very important for our patients with chronic kidney disease, including those with uh, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the meeting starts with the question and the meeting ends with that question. And uh, we need to be able to answer this important question for them because they say that they are encountering this important piece of information that they have now chronic kidney disease or maybe they knew it or they were just told they have chronic kidney disease and uh, that has an impact on their lifestyle and everything else that they do and if we are not able to answer that question then I think uh, we may not be able to build the, the needed trust as a healthcare professional. So therefore, we need to be able to provide the answer based on evidence. And, and based on that, this is what I, I train patients and I tell them, I educate them. I have to say that education is probably a better word than I tell them that for more training, they need to work with a dietitian or dietitians that can help them be uh, uh, capable of controlling their chronic disease. So Dr. Kalantar, with that said, can you share with us some of your success stories? What have you, say you have a CKD patient who has come to you asking you, he's that patient that, that's the first question that and last question they ask is about what to eat. So tell us about a successful patient that you've had in implementing nutrition therapy for that CKD patient and then what was the outcome? Yes, the, uh, I think the success is uh, probably described uh, or understood by the patient as to how they usually ask, can I cure my CKD? And I say CKD doesn't have cure. If you have chronic kidney disease and if the uh, diagnosis is accurate, you have chronic kidney disease. Then they ask me, uh, so what, what can I do? I said, you will be very successful if we can stop or slow progression of chronic kidney disease because chronic kidney disease is a progressive disease that continues and gets worse over time. And the same is uh, with different types of chronic kidney disease such as uh, polycystic kidney disease. So therefore, 
when they are told by other doctors that eventually you need the dialysis or kidney transplantation, then I say that, look, I'm here to help you. We nephrologists are here and, and nutrition experts, dietitians to help you to slow progression. And it could be synergistic with the medication or medications you receive. So we want to work together. And if, I, if, if uh, the prediction is that you need dialysis in two years, five years, 10 years, if I can give you another one year, two years, five years, 10 years on top of that five to 10 years, then we have been exceptionally successful. And we have had these uh, success stories actually. And I can't quite say that this was only because of uh, nutrition therapy, medical nutrition therapy, or because of medication or because of changing lifestyle or other things, it's probably a combination of all of the above. When we offer to these patients great effective medication or medicines, as we are now, uh, as the recent, uh, some of these have recently evolved for chronic uh, polycystic kidney disease, then it is important to offer them the synergistic components of that, and among others, uh, uh, nutrition therapy. So therefore, our success would be if we can allow them to have longer interval before they need dialysis or kidney transplantation. That's, that's wonderful to hear. And specifically, when it comes to a general CKD patient who's non-dialysis, and I know there have been many, many publications on this, a lot of them uh, coming from, from you, what specifically would you prescribe in terms of parameters and in, in terms of uh, protein intake, um, fluid intake, um, sodium intake, potassium, all of the different parameters? Yeah, thank you. That's essentially the question they all have. And I tell them that uh, even though there are mixed data, we're still looking at uh, old and, and current data, they are relatively consistent that high protein, high intake of protein may be harmful. So if you are a person who are eating a lot of protein, meat, steak, uh, other things, maybe one way is to give it at least a try of low protein diet. And I share with them the data suggesting that what is called low protein diet is not necessarily inadequate. It's not, it's not necessarily low. It's in no way is it inadequate but it may help slowing progression and it may help uh, work synergistically with the medication. Now, then they ask me, okay, so what kind of low protein diet should I consider? And I tell them that I prefer that half of this be plant-based sources and the other half is your choice, right? So not only go, do we go lower on protein and usually for, for dietary protein, uh, scientifically, and dietetically, it's based on grams of protein per kilogram ideal body weight or body weight per day. For example, in the United States, usually people on average eat 1.2 to 1.4 grams of protein per kilogram body, or body weight per day. And I tell them, if you have early uh, CKD or uh, early PKD, at least avoid above one grams per kilogram body weight per day. And if you have more advanced CKD, then 0.6 to 0.8, consistent with also upcoming guidelines. So this is about the protein. And then, as I said, I, I recommend that half of this be plant-based diet. Then with, in, with regard to salt, I just tell them that please uh, uh, try moderately low salt. We don't want to go excessive. So usually I ask them to consider sodium less than three grams, even though American Heart says even lower, less than 2.3 grams. And then uh, with, with regard to everything else, I asked them to consider a healthy lifestyle and, and the first two, that's, that means low protein diet with 50% uh, uh, plant-based sources and, and avoiding high salt diet is consistent with the general healthy diet recommendation. In, in being a renal dietitian myself, Dr. Kalantar, I agree with you in the approach of lower protein, plant-based, but there's a lot of controversy when it comes to that topic, um, whether it be from the nephrology community of maybe if we're not giving enough protein, our patients may be malnourished or we don't give them complete proteins. There's some misinformation on that as science has, has advanced. 
So what would you say to a healthcare practitioner who is saying you they don't agree with a low protein diet because because there's uh, still it's the still controversial in the data? Yes, uh, good point. Actually, in fact, uh, there are different requirements for different different stages of chronic kidney disease. Let me give you an example: a patient who is on dialysis, a dial a maintenance dialysis patient, he or she needs higher protein intake. So usually uh, in our dialysis rounds, and I have uh, quite many patients on dialysis, I always tell them, you need to eat above 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day of protein. Roughly it's 80 to 120 grams of protein. If somebody is 70 to 80 kilograms, for example, and it's 160 to 200 pounds. But when it's about CKD, not yet on dialysis, that's my recommendation. And uh, according to the, uh, National Academy of Medicine's data, the recommended dietary allowance of protein is 0.8. So that means Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Medicine recommends only 0.8. So we in the United States, we eat more now. The high protein diet that has been recommended for diabetes and obesity, it has a value. We're not here to question that. But the value of it has been questioned when it's about chronic kidney disease. There are now emerging data suggesting that high protein intake could cause harm on kidney health, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so therefore, and also now on top of that, I have to say that there are disease specific uh, data. For example, not all CKDs are the same. There is diabetic CKD, sometimes called diabetic kidney disease or DKD. Then there is polycystic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And let me just highlight you an example that there was recently an animal model of polycystic kidney disease suggesting that ketogenic diet could help with, an, uh, with uh, the cyst formations or progression of uh, cysts. So therefore, now you may say that, how can we reconcile this thing? So I have actually worked with some of my patients in informing uh, plant-based, low-protein, ketogenic diet. So, so that's essentially where the innovations and, and dietetics or dietary uh, support is, is needed and, and is quite useful. So in, in summary, we can't say there is one size for all, and that's why the need of evaluation of these patients in terms of their stage and the, their, their need, if there's a patient who has protein energy waste malnutrition, Cachexia, on those patients, I said, I really tell them to stop low protein diet and for a few weeks until protein energy wasting is gone mm -hmm. to be more uh, flexible. So we adjust these things and, and therefore it's, it's a, a teamwork and, uh, and multidisciplinary approach across all these things. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kalantar, you uh, mentioned polycystic kidney disease and uh, we here at Otska have uh, spent uh, many years uh, focusing on polycystic kidney disease. So just to focus in on that a little bit, you mentioned the animal model looking at uh, the use of ketogenic diet in um, polycystic kidney disease and its effect on cyst growth. Now, if it's a ketogenic diet, by definition, is a an extremely low carbohydrate diet. I think it's less than 15 or 20 uh, grams per day, and it's mostly high protein and high fat. So, if you're implementing a ketogenic diet that is low protein in nature, then most of the nutrition would be coming from fat sources. So, for a patient who has PKD and uh, is otherwise generally healthy maybe not yet obese, um, would that kind of a diet really be feasible in, for everyday implementation? And what effects would it have? Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, we have managed one of our dietitians, actually two of them. I've, uh, I'm working, I work with uh, six to eight dietitians at the University of California, Irvine. And, uh, and other dietitians in the community also, they have uh, taken our CME courses and and feel comfortable with uh, some of these challenges. Just uh, give, give, giving you an example, you can. There are actually the community. If you look up, there are there, there are uh, and there are well described uh, plant based plant based uh, low uh, ketogenic diet. So so then, and there are people who describe that. There are scientific papers about them. 
there are uh, ketogenic diets that have moderately low protein and the fat part is a healthy fat mostly from from plant-based sources and these are things that we work with uh, with our patients as i said w- uh, there are different uh, levels also of protein intake so 1.1 to 1.2 grams 1.8 to 1 grams 4.6 to 0.8 K- kidoki uh, that means the guidelines, kidney disease outcome quality initiative that will be published on July 1st so recommends 0. 0.55 to 0. 0.6 for non-diabetics and 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8, as you will see in July 2020. And for everybody, they say for everybody. So, But, but we say that there are uh, stratified uh, approaches. And I think they're all doable. It needs a, a good team of uh, physicians and dietitians working together hand-to-hand. Another problem that, for example, uh, wasn't mentioned yet, but I expect it will come up. People always ask, what about potassium, right? Not infrequently, these patients here, especially from dialysis dietitians, that's all about potassium. And then we always tell them that if you do it correctly, potassium should not be a major challenge either because uh, a good uh, plant-based diet, high-fiber diet should help you with uh, GI, uh, with uh, GI tract and, and microbiome and bowel movement. So therefore, that's why uh, while I said it's a streamlined approach, it's, it also requires expertise and there is some level of complexity here. And uh, together we have been successful and we continue to work with our great dietitians and other teammates. And, and on top of that, patient is the center of all of these things. The patient is motivated is the most important component of the team. And these patients are highly motivated because they all want to have that option. How can I slow progression? And that's why they take advantage of great medications that have emerged recently for pulses, kidney disease, and diet that we offer to them as working together synergistically. So, Dr. Kalantar, you have mentioned a couple times about plant-based diet, and as you're talking, I'm thinking about should the conversation change or switch from low-protein to whole-food plant-based? Because we know that with a whole-food plant-based diet, that patients will get enough protein if done correctly, and like as you said, using your 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 team of uh, dietitians and nurses and so forth. And we know that also that with a plant-based diet, there's also other benefits, as you mentioned, the microbiome, um, typically the potassium doesn't go up. It's a high fiber diet. Um, there's, a, there's an effect on metabolic acidosis. So are there other parameters about a whole food plant-based diet that we're not talking about that maybe we need to refocus and, and maybe not focus so much on the protein? Yeah, very good question again. Uh, and I think uh, your point is well taken. Now, when I say plant-based, I have recently changed this to Mm plant-dominant. Now, why? Because not everybody wants to become uh, 80% or 100% vegan. I'm not vegan either. I I eat still fish, for example. I mean, everybody has a different choice. And I don't want people to feel that they are coming to us and we're going to force them to become vegetarian or vegan. So we say that, look, we have this option for you. I would like you to try to switch more to plants, dominant plant-based, but you will have 50% your choice of dairy product, fish, other healthy products. If you think about uh, the healthy diet for hypertension, it's called DASH diet. It still has some meat, but smaller than what mm-hmm. we eat in the, on a day-to-day basis, for example. So therefore, and then there are patients who choose to become vegetarian or vegan. There are patients who will remain, uh, 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 essentially, they eat whatever they want, and patients who become pescatarian. And that allows patients to also maintain their level of uh, satisfaction with their choice. And over time, they change. They, they will have flexibility to move back and forth. But the, uh, but what the basis of this approach is, healthy diet, high fiber diet, more plants, controlling potassium through uh, other effective approaches and having a healthy microbiome and uh, avoiding extra burden on kidneys by virtue of high protein, especially protein from animal-based diet, food sources that are known to uh, 
cause intraglomerular pressure and uh, wear and tear on kidneys. Because these kidneys, patients that are having CKD, DKD, or PKD, possessive kidney disease, this, this is every remaining part of that kidney is precious. We have to cherish that. We give them medication to avoid increasing in size of polycystic kidney patients, and we need to also ensure that the diet is synergistic with them. For your polycystic kidney disease patients specifically, um, what do you recommend in terms of fluid intake that you think is manageable for your patients and something that they're going to actually adhere to? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, there are misconceptions on both sides. There are some who come and say that my doctor said I should not drink anything at all. My kidneys cannot handle it. And uh, they actually at the ver sometimes are very verge of dehydration, even when they feel thirsty. And there are those who come suddenly, and when I do 24-hour urine collection, I see that they are drinking six to eight liters of uh, fluid a day. And I have had those cases. It's a, they come with two or three jars of 24-hour uh, urine. And I say that, look, you need to maintain the adequate fluid intake. That's important. If your kidneys are early stage of CKD, there is no reason for you to have fluid restriction. If anything, adequate fluid is more important. And if you start medications that makes, makes you thirsty, you need to respond to thirst. That's very important. For example, one approach to polycystic kidney disease is through those medications. And if they don't respond to thirst, then they have not done correctly. So, so we need to work. This is yet another component of, the, of nutrition and diet to tell them that adequate fluid intake is very important. And, and don't go over, don't overdo this. And, 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 and while there are sporadic things about fluid restrictions that may not apply to you, especially under this regimen and under these circumstances. So fluid, uh, I, I think that's also an important aspect that needs to be discussed with the patient. Very good. So you've given us a lot of information about how you would manage a patient with CKD for, through nutrition management. Now let's add the patient who has diabetes with that. What additional information or suggestions would you, what would you use to, to treat those patients who have diabetes on top of CKD? Well, for diabetes, we continue to monitor their uh, blood sugar. And uh, even prior to diabetes, maybe if somebody wants to uh, ask a question about blood pressure, I always ask the patient that the, your assignment is in, on top of working with uh, dietitians and writing down what you eat on a daily basis and, and bringing to me and bringing to the dietitian who works with me. You also need to check your blood pressure at least twice, uh, at least once, if not twice. And I need to see uh, everything and uh, the blood pressure values. And if you have diabetes, I, I would like to see where we are going with your blood sugar. And uh, sometimes with worsening CKD, actually, some of the CKD patients, DKD patients with diabetes kidneys or positive kidneys patients who nowadays, many of them also have diabetes they may see actually uh, the blood sugar going to the other side. So not infrequent, they, they present to emergency with hypoglycemic events, right? So it's important to adjust again across different stages of polycystic kidney disease or, or it's, uh, chronic kidney disease and ensure that we not again have a one size fit all approach to diabetes of these patients. Once a diabetic patient has CKD, that is a different diabetes and requires also a different approach. So Dr. Kalantar, in your opinion, why do you think medical nutrition therapy is not universally a part of standard care with a CKD patient? We have all this information, you've given us all this uh, data. Why isn't this just a, a standard of care for these patients? Uh, yes, there are several reasons. One is that uh, uh, in, in recent years, uh, the uh, education of physicians uh, had some of those inadequacies in terms of uh, dietary and nutrition approach. That means the, 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 the discipline of nutrition and diet in medical school has not been strong. Now it's mm -hmm. coming back for a variety of reasons, for good reasons. So, so physicians are becoming hopefully more and more nutrition centric, but uh, until now, they were not quite honest. 
some of them who deviates from their mainstream and they go and, and learn and, and it was a niche and hopefully it will expand. The second one is that our dietitians have been mostly focusing on either diabetes or if it's about kidney diseases, dialysis. And, and dialysis industry has been expanding and, and the, it, per requirement, regulatory requirement, they require di, 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 uh, dietitians. So therefore a lot of uh, dietitians learn how to take care of dialysis patients and they miss the opportunity of earlier CKD mm -hmm. stages, how to help these patients to defer, prevent or defer dialysis. And the third one, uh, uh, the third factor is related to reimbursement because uh, while dietitians are covered when they work with di dialysis patients, there is some reimbursement issues with CKD, earlier CKD stages. Unless they have diabetes, even that one is uh, somewhat limited. Now, there are also changes happening across reimbursement at, uh, in state and, and in federal government and CMS. So we, so we, so it's good actually to start our line and we're going to see return of medical nutrition therapy back to CKD stages, earlier stages before dialysis. That's great. I know when I worked in my physician practice as a CKD dietitian, I had plenty of nephrologists that referred their patients to me, but there were a good handful that still didn't refer and told me they didn't really believe in in, yeah. in medical nutritional therapy. So what do we say to those those individuals still? How do we get them to to move? How do we move the needle in treating our patients not only with the medication management but holistic holistically with nutrition as well? Very good. We're going to say that this is era of patient centeredness, mm -hmm. right? Patient is the center of everything. Patient asks, requires, expects from us. We can't ignore that. And and on, on top of that, they may also refer to some old data. There was a study called Modification of uh, Diet in Renal Disease and mm -hmm. DRD Study, which was declared in 1994 negative. That means uh, the right. diet did not work, wasn't very effective. Actually, there, there were positive data on that one. And that, that study actually had over 20% polycystic in these patients. But the study was short term, and, and some people still refer to that 30 year old study and say that things have not changed. And, and the answer is look, there are so many newer data, emerging data, and also prior to that. So, therefore, patients, when they ask you, doctor, what should I eat? If we ignore that, it says, go, I don't have any recommendation for you. I'm going to just give you blood pressure medications. Then I think we have ignored what the expectations are. The government, the state, everybody is not uh, expecting from us to be patient centered and patients uh, wants from us to offer that. And hopefully we work together to offer medical nutrition therapy of the contemporary era related to 2020 and beyond. Dr. Kalantar, you mentioned that patients are very motivated um, and they always ask you at the beginning of their meeting and at the end of the meeting what they should eat. But what have you found long-term adherence to look like with these patients? When you make a recommendation diet-wise, are they able to stick to it in the long term, one, two, three years out? Yeah, that is a very good question. That means uh, what happens short term versus long term? It's a journey, and a journey needs that we work together, we have a plan, and we <clears throat> look at the challenges and adjust. And therefore, once again, the role of committed physician and expert dietitian. So it's a teamwork. After two months, three months, six months, things could go. Uh, up and down. And I have, however, patients are quite committed to this. Most patients, I mean, some physicians say that, oh, they don't even listen to me, but I, I have seen the opposite. We see the opposite because patients even come from those physicians to us. I say that uh, in New York, in LA County, uh, the, you know, people tell us there is no nutrition, there is nothing I can recommend. I, I would like to see what I should eat or not to eat. When they fly even to see me, why can't we do that? Now, if after six months or a year, they, they could go extreme to either way, they could have adherence problem, they could even uh, overdo things. And that's why every three months I see them, sometimes every six months, those who are more compliant, 
and every three to six months or even sometimes more frequently, our dietitians continue to work with. So it works. There is nothing without a challenge. It's not a, a black and white optimal perfect picture, but it does work. And, and it, there is a lot of uh, satisfaction coming from the patients as well as healthcare providers, allied healthcare providers, that means dietitians and physicians and others. Yeah, you have a motivated uh, population, but also I keep hearing you say it, it takes a team approach as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. Especially look, when you tell them you have here the option of dialysis and transplant, which is nothing bad. I always say dialysis and kidney transplantation is like cancer chemotherapy. When you need this, we offer this to you, including myself. But if we can avoid cancer chemotherapy, with uh, since it has also other side effects and suffering and dialysis is the same, why not? I don't think there is anybody who would tell you that, oh, I want to start dialysis earlier than later. It would be, I would be surprised. And kidney transplant is also not available for everybody. So we need to work together to extend to slow progression of kidney disease. And that's why we are here. Yes, well, thank you so much, Dr. Kalantaf, for joining us today. Uh, we learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience will really appreciate all of your insights. Thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Kalantar for joining us today. That was a great discussion on dietary management and CKD. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed the discussion. We'll see you next time here on Nephew.